Alan Mendelssohn, The Boy from Mars, by Daniel Pinkwater. Chapters 1, 2, and 3. Chapter 1. I got off to a bad start at Bat Masterson Junior High School. My family had moved from my old school district during the summer, and I didn't know a single kid at the school. On top of that, it turned out that kids at Bat Masterson put a lot of emphasis on how you look. This created a problem. I am a short, portly kid, and I wear glasses. Every other kid in the school was tall, had a suntan, and none of them wore glasses. Also, clothes wrinkle up on me. I don't know why this should be. Five minutes after I get dressed in the morning, everything is wrinkled. It looks like I slept in my clothes. Not only did I not know anybody on my first day, not only did I find out that a short, portly, wrinkled kid with glasses is an outcast in that school, but I also sat down on somebody's half-finished good humor bar in the schoolyard. That reduced my confidence. Then it turned out that the school was not expecting me. My records and grades and whatever the old school was supposed to send, they had not sent, or they had sent them to the wrong place, or they had gotten lost. So I had to sit on this bench in the office for most of the morning, sort of sticking to the bench because of the leftover good humor on the seat of my pants. Finally, they gave me this big pile of cards to fill out. Then I had to run all over the school getting teachers to sign the cards. Three or four times I had to go back to the office with notes from teachers saying that their class was full or it was the wrong class or it conflicted with another class I was supposed to take. And each time I entered a classroom, the class would giggle at me. Then the teacher would ask my name. It was written right at the top of every one of the cards but the teacher would ask me to say it anyway. Leonard Niebel, I would say, and the kids in the class would just go wild. I don't know why, but my name gets them every time. At lunchtime, I walked around the schoolyard. All the kids sort of looked sort of grown up and unwrinkled. Some of the girls even had lipstick on. The kids stood around in groups talking and laughing. Some guys were showing off, walking on top of benches and chasing each other and hollering. Nobody looked at me or said anything to me. I had the feeling that if I tried to talk to anybody, they wouldn't have been able to hear me. I looked for a quiet spot to eat my tuna fish sandwich. After lunch, I went back to the office. The lady there had told me to come back at the beginning of each period. She looked at my cards and Colt told me to go to gym class. I went. When I got to the gym, there was a bunch of kids sitting in rows on the floor. The teacher was standing on a bench. He was wearing S, a, S, S's and had a whistle on a lanyard around his neck. He had white sneakers on. I went around the kids sitting on the floor and came up to him from the side, holding out the card he was supposed to sign. You're late, boy, he said. He had a very loud voice. The the lady in the office, I, I'm supposed to, this card, you, you have to sign my, the teacher cut me off. Nobody comes late to gym, he shouted. He really scared me. I could see all his teeth. Anybody comes late to gym, he does five laps. Now do five laps, chubby. Work off some of that lard. And while you're running, listen to what I'm telling the class. I started running, holding my stack of cards. You will get two pairs of gym shorts green, two pairs of sweat socks white. You will get a sweatshirt gray. The gym teacher was shouting at the class. His name was Mr. Jerris. His voice was so loud it made my ears hurt, even when I was making my turn at the far end of the gym. That's five, fat boy. Take a rest, Mr. Jerris said. Now... Since none of you have any equipment, you can spend the rest of the period horsing around quietly. Mr. Jarrah spun around, jumped off the bench, and walked through a little door at the back of the gym. I was sweating and out of breath. I expected the other kids to start up with Fat Boy and Chubby after Mr. Jarrah had called me those things, which was unfair since I'm actually not 
fat, but portly. That's what it says on the label when I get clothes in the department store. Boys portly. The other kids didn't tease me. They didn't pay atten any attention to me at all. They went right to work, fooling with the gym equipment, doing handstands, swinging from the rings, and stuff like that. I looked at the door Mr. Jarris had gone through. I wondered if I should go and knock on it. I just stood there holding my cards for a long time. Mr. Jarris came back. I said, quietly! His voice made an echo. Come here, fatty, I'll sign that. I started to walk towards him. Run! I ran. Mr. Jarris signed my card. Now, by tomorrow, make sure you have at least gym shoes. By the end of the week, I want you to have all your equipment. Got that? Uh, he looked at my card. Neeble? Mr. Jarris went back through the little door. The gym class was the high point of the day for sheer unpleasantness, but all the other classes I went to were more or less the same. The teachers seemed annoyed that I was there, making them sign one more thing or send for an extra textbook, and not one kid said anything to me, although quite a few giggled at my name. By the time school let out and I started walking home, I was totally miserable. Our new house was almost a mile from school, and I didn't like it. There wasn't one kid my age in the neighborhood, except for some very little kids, babies really, a couple of blocks away. There were no kids at all. About the only good thing that happened since we moved out of our old apartment in the old neighborhood was that my parents let me have a dog. The dog's name was Melvin, a big brown dog we got at the pound. I had had him since the middle of the summer, and he hadn't been able to learn a single trick. I spent about two weeks trying to teach Melvin to fetch a ball. I couldn't even get him to look at it. About the only thing Melvin could do that was sort of unusual was walk in his sleep. Still, he seemed to like me and would take naps in my room, snoring and mumbling while I read or worked on a model airplane. When I got home, Melvin was sleeping in the front hall. He opened one eye to say hello and then dozed off. My mother was in the kitchen, cooking liver for Melvin's supper. Cooked liver was all he would eat. I hate the smell of liver cooking. The whole house smelled of it. Everything in the house was still sort of new. My parents had bought all new furniture when we moved. My mother had picked out a lot of stuff from my room so it would look like a picture she had seen in a magazine. I wasn't allowed to put any tacks in the walls because of the plaid wallpaper, which was very expensive, but just perfect for a boy's room, my mother said, so I couldn't put up any posters or pictures or anything. I flopped down on my bed, which had a plaid bedspread to match the wallpaper. How do you like your new school? My mother shouted from the kitchen. I told her it was fine. What else could I say? Melvin wandered in with his eyes half open and sort of crashed down on his elbows next to my bed. In 30 seconds, he was snoring. I closed my eyes and tried to pretend we were still living in the old apartment. Chapter 2 the old apartment was in a neighborhood where none of the houses had lawns, and backyards were either concrete or dirt. There were a lot of kids around, and you can get into a ball game or a conversation or trade comics just by going outside. It didn't seem to matter to anybody that I was portly or wrinkled. The best thing about our old apartment was that my grandparents had an apartment in the same building. I used to spend a lot of time at their place. My grandmother likes everyone to call her old one, and she's always saying things like, Listen well, young one, and mark well, my child. She believes that everyone ought to eat only raw food, except meat, which she believes nobody should eat at all. She spends all her time grinding up nuts and wheat berries and soybeans and mashing them together with honey and raisins and stuff. It tastes better than it sounds. My grandfather likes to be called Grandfather. He has this parrot named Lucky, and he's always fooling with him, spraying him for mites or bathing his feet or just 
walking around with Lucky on his shoulder. Both my grandparents eat basically what Lucky eats. There are some other people living in my grandparents' apartment. Madame Zella Noah is a friend of my grandmother's. She's an anthropologist and she comes from Europe. She's studying the people of the Himalayas, especially their cooking. When my grandmother isn't dishing out her ground up stuff, Madame Zealot Noah is making things like roasted barley floating in strong tea with melted butter and scallions. This stuff tastes worse than it sounds. Some people come and go. Great Uncle Boris lives there in the winter time. Uncle Boris is a movie nut. He takes eight millimeter movies of clouds and squirrels in the park. Once he took a bus all over the country and took pictures of the sky in every state in the Union except Alaska and Hawaii. I used to hang out in my grandparents' apartment as often as I could. The thing I liked about it was that everyone there didn't treat me in any special way. They were all sort of interested in various things and they would talk to me about them in just the same way they would talk to anybody. Not being able to drop in at my grandparents' apartment was probably the worst thing about moving to the new house. I was thinking about all this when I heard the electric radio-controlled garage door open. This was a special gadget of my father's. He had it installed the first week we had the new house. There was a button on the dashboard of his car. When he got within two blocks of the house, he'd push the button and a little radio transmitter under the hood would start an electric motor in the garage that would open the door. When he got inside, he'd push the button again and the door would close. Sometimes the door would open and close by itself as trucks with two-way radios went by. Melvin struggled to his feet and stumbled off to say hello to my father, yawning. My father always got a bigger welcome than I did. I heard the back door slam twice, and Melvin dragged himself back into my room, still yawning, and settled down to sleep again. I knew what had happened. My father had come out of the garage, stepped through the back door, kissed my mother, patted Melvin on the head, taken off his coat, and hung it on a hook, first taking his apron off the hook. The apron had What's Cooking printed on the front, and a picture of a guy in a chef's hat standing in front of a barbecue with a big cloud of smoke coming up from it. Next, my father had gone outside, that was the second slam, and started building a fire in the portable barbecue. This had been going on all summer. He would pour some charcoal out of a bag, spray about a gallon of starter fluid over it, and throw in a match. Then he would stand around for maybe an hour, watching to see that the fire didn't go out and blowing on it once in a while to keep it hot. Meanwhile, my mother would be in the kitchen getting the meat ready, steaks or hamburgers or chicken. At the same time, Melvin's liver would be cooling on the counter. When the fire was ready, my father would holler to my mother and my mother would holler to Melvin and me. While we were making our way to the table, she would run outside and give my father the hamburgers or whatever, and then she would run inside and put Melvin's dish of cool, cooked liver down. Then she would run outside again and get the first of the hamburgers off the fire from my father. Then she would run in and give one to me. Then my father would come in wearing his apron and with a big long fork in one hand and holding a platter with the rest of the hamburgers in the other, and we would all eat supper. Besides the hamburgers or steak, we would have salad. My parents had been to a restaurant where they served this special salad with chopped hard-boiled egg on it and anchovies and all sorts of stuff. The waiter makes the salad at the table and he has these oversized pepper mills and salt shakers made of wood, and he does a whole routine with the salad. Anyway, my father had gotten the same kind of wooden salt and pepper shakers and the same kind of big stainless steel salad bowl, and he would go through the whole routine every night. Before we moved to the new house, I had always liked hamburgers and things like that. Now I was getting bored. My parents weren't, though. How do you like your new school, son? My father asked. It's okay, I said. Have you made any new friends? 
None of the kids talk to me. Well, it's always hard the first day in a new school, my father said. You'll make friends. I don't think so, I said. You say that none of the children will talk to you? My mother said, have you tried to talk to any of them? I didn't say anything. I didn't know how to tell my mother the snotty kids at Bat Masters in junior high school were sure to think I was a creep. To have a friend, be a friend, my mother said. You just walk up to the other children and say, Hi, my name is Leonard Niebel, and you'll see how quickly you'll get to know some very nice people. I could just imagine how that would go over. Now, promise me you'll do that, Leonard, my mother said. I don't want you to develop any complexes. You had lots of friends in the old neighborhood. Chapter 3 Walking to school the next day, I thought it over, my mother's suggestion. After all, the kids at Bat Masterson couldn't be all that bad. Maybe I just needed to give them a chance. Maybe I was being too sensitive. After all, only a few kids had giggled at me, not all of them. I decided I would try to be friendly. I had been assigned to a homeroom, room 107. Every day at the beginning and end of school, I had to go to room 107. There was a teacher there, Miss Steele. She would be my homeroom teacher all through junior high school. In our homeroom period, which was about 15 minutes, Miss Steele would read us announcements and help us with our problems. That's what they told me in the office when I was filling out cards. I went to room 107 and found a seat. That's my desk, little boy, someone said. It was a girl, about six feet tall. Now get out of here so I can sit with my friends. Most of the girls were taller than me, but this one was really a giant. I thought I'd try out my friendly stuff. Hi, my name is Leonard Niebel, I said. I, I didn't know that seats had been assigned. Just get out of here, you little pimple, she said. I took another seat in the back of the room. The giant girl sat down at the desk and leaned forward, talking to a bunch of other girls, all of whom were taller than me. I watched kids drift into room 107. They all seemed to know each other. They waved and smiled and changed seats so they could be near their friends. Obviously, seats had not been assigned. That big, dopey girl could have just asked me to change seats. I was sitting in the last seat in the last row so I could see everything that happened in the room. A teacher came in. She was tall and sort of old. She smiled at the class with her lips pressed together. The bell rang. Class, come to order, Miss Steele said. Everybody sort of shuffled around in their seats. Now get ready for the PA announcements, Miss Steele said. The door opened and a little kid came in. He was a lot shorter than me and was wearing brand new blue jeans with the cuffs turned up about halfway to his knees. He had these real thick glasses that made his eyes look like fish in a bowl. He looked like he was about six years old. Then I heard chimes. Bong, boing, boing. It was the PA, the public address system. There was a big loudspeaker on the wall of the classroom up near the clock. Welcome to your second day of the fall term at Matt Masterson Junior High School, a voice said. This is Mr. Winter, your principal. I trust you are all settling down to work in your classes, and I hope we can all enjoy this term together. However, nobody is going to enjoy this term if we have the same problem in the schoolyard with waste paper and candy wrappers that we had last term. You children are privileged to live in the greatest country in the world and to go to a school which has a beautiful campus which has been re resurfaced with blacktop. There are waste baskets every, exactly every 20 feet in our lovely lunch court, and there are benches, all freshly painted for you to see 
sit on in the fine weather and enjoy your lunch. The benches are for sitting, not for standing on, and certainly not for carving and defacing. And the wastebaskets are for your waste paper and refuse. You will see some of your fellow students wearing armbands in orange and green, our school colors. These are lunch court monitors, and I expect you to listen to them. If a lunch court monitor tells you to pick up a candy wrapper, you will pick that candy wrapper up. The lunch court monitor has the authority to report you to the lunch court teacher and the lunch court lunch court teacher has the authority to send you to my office now my office is open to all students all the time with legitimate problems but i don't want to see any student in my office because of a violation of the lunch court code he went on like that it was impossible to listen kids were talking to each other and miss Steele was writing in her attendance book i decided to try out my friendliness on the little kid next to me Hi, I said. My name is Leonard Niebel. Yeah, I know, said the kid. You're the weirdo. I saw you in gym class yesterday. You there, in the last seat. No talking. Stand up. What's your name? Miss Steele was shouting at me. My name got the usual laughs. Miss Steele went on about how we were all supposed to listen to the PA, and did I think I was a special character in the background? Oh, in the character? In the background, Mr. Winter was still booming away on the loudspeaker. We always show consideration for others by keeping to the right when passing through the halls, and we do not wear shoes with metal taps. Any boy wearing shoes with metal taps may be reported by the hall monitor who will have the right to send him to my office, which is always open to any student with a legitimate problem, but I don't want to see... It went on until the bell rang. I went to my first class, which was English. Apparently, the day before, when I hadn't been there, the teacher had the class write a composition on what they did on their summer vacation. Today, she was going to have the kids read their papers. Since I didn't write one, I felt safe in my seat at the back of the room. Several kids were chosen to get up and read their papers. All of them had been somewhere. Some of them had been to summer camps, fancy ones that specialize in dance or tennis, or horseback riding. One kid had gone to Europe on a tour for kids, and another one had gone with his folks. The teacher's name was Miss Trumbull, and she seemed fairly nice. We have one new boy in class, she said, who hasn't written a paper, but maybe he'll tell us about his summer anyway. Uh, Leonard Niebel? There was the giggling. Kids swiveled around to see who Leonard Niebel was. Leonard, wouldn't you like to come to the front of the room and tell us about your summer vacation? Miss Trumbull asked. My face felt hot. I went to the front of the room. Well, my parents and I moved to a new house, I said. That's very nice, Miss Trumbull said. And what else happened to you over the summer? I got a dog, I said. Oh, how lucky for you, Miss Trumbull said. What kind of dog is it, Leonard? What kind? There was something creeping into Miss Trumbull's voice that told me she was getting the idea I was feeble-minded and needed to be helped along. Is it a, a poodle or a Dalmatian or a, a Scotty, Leonard? She said. No, it's, he's just a big brown dog. We got him at the pound. There was a silence. I couldn't see the kids in the class. I was looking at the floor. Don't mumble, Leonard, Miss Trumbull said. Did anything else happen during the summer that you'd like to tell us? Well, I, I worked, I said. Oh, you had a job. That's wonderful, Miss Trumbull said. Would you like to tell us what sort of job it was? Just helping my father in his business. And what sort of business is it, Leonard? I had the feeling Miss Trumbull thought I didn't know how to talk, and she was going to teach me right then and there. Her voice was sort of extra sweet, and she was sort of leaning forward and bending around so she could stand behind me and look at my face at the same time. It's a rag business, I said. Different peddlers bring rags, and my father buys them, and we weigh them and sort them and pack them in bales, and, I, and we sell them to factories and places. I was picking up speed. 
I sort of liked working there, except a couple of times I got fleas. Thank you very much, Leonard, for telling us about your interesting summer. You may return to your seat. Miss Trumbull was standing a good way behind me, while the kids were scratching themselves like they had fleas and making chimpanzee faces as I walked to the back of the room. I don't remember too much about the rest of the day. I gave up on trying to be a friend to have a friend and spent the lunch period by myself. One kid did talk to me. A lunch court monitor made me pick up a Three Musketeers wrapper that wasn't mine. I didn't say anything to him. I just picked it up and carried it to one of the wire wastebaskets placed every 20 feet and dropped it in. After lunch, I went to my gym class. As I walked through the door of the gym, I heard this terrifically loud voice shout, Fatso! Where are your gym shoes? So ends chapter 3. Alan Mendelssohn, The Boy from Mars.